again? Yeah, after you finish, just to the Okay. All right, everybody. Um, moving on to the next panel. This will be my easiest introduction of the day because I'm going to hand over the mic to Stefan and he'll do the rest. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. Uh, so. Uh, I think we all feel great to be here, and thank you all for listening, and we'll go straight to the point. Uh, today with us are uh, Miao from Superfluid, uh, Mario from uh, Ethereum Foundation, uh, George from Consensus, uh, Anton from Chain Security, and Nebuisha and myself are from Tenderly. Uh, guys, if you want to say like one or two short sentences about yourselves, introduce yourselves, and we'll get straight to the point. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was building super token. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I'm from I'm from uh, Superfluid. We have been building uh, the uh, the magical token called Super Token for quite a while, and uh, um, I don't know enough about uh, EOF, but uh, I I hope I can provide some also my new thoughts about it also for this talk. Thank you. <laughs> Um, hey everyone, I'm Mario. I work with EF, uh, specifically protocol support team, uh, which is a team which helps to coordinate the work around core devs and uh, well, uh, also to um, test ship hard forks. So I'm more of a technical part of this team where I dive into some research around the, the, the uh, uh, current research and uh, I'm, I've been running uh, the protocol fellowship, so I'm helping to onboard new core developers. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is George. I'm from Consensus Diligence and uh, I mostly do smart contract security audits, some tooling and some ZKP research here and there nowadays. Nice. Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Nebusha, one of the co-founders in Tenderly. Uh, we are building a developer platform that helps builders be more productive and efficient when they're uh, building and testing smart contracts. Um, mainly, I'm working on our custom virtual machine that is capable of extracting more data during the runtime. Uh, hello, my name is Anton. I'm from Chain Security. We are also uh, doing audits for uh, Ethereum smart contracts. And uh, also, internally, we're doing different tools and uh, keeping a close eye on uh, all the changes in the bytecode and UF including. Mm -hmm. uh, it affects our security tooling a lot, I would say. And, yeah. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> so, uh, for the intro, uh, Nebusha will really shortly go through like the the what Ethereum object format is. But we wouldn't want to focus too much on the technical aspect aspects of it today. We would like to focus on what the e, what kind of impact EOF will have in the space and on developers. So, Nebusha, take yeah. it away. Um, right. I'm going to do ju just the short inf intro and. Anybody from the panel can also chime in if they have something to add. So basically, Ethereum object format uh, introduces this new way of how smart contract bytecode should look like. Um, by that, I mean it, it, uh, it restricts uh, how the exactly the sections of the bytecode need to uh, behave and look like. And this has uh, uh, a lot of implications. Uh, the first one is that um, on the runtime, we no longer need to do and perform some checks, which can, um, in essence, um, help us with the scalability of uh, the whole Ethereum. But uh, as a consequence, we need to do um, some checks on the deployment time. Um, right. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. I mean, if. Anybody has something? Yeah, I would, I would mention just one important thing that, like, the whole name is wrong here. Like, mm -hmm. I was I was telling the organizers, and I, I think it was changed in the schedule, but it's still here. It's not Ethereum object format, it's EVM object yeah. format. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we are talking about the Ethereum virtual machine, the the heart of Ethereum, the, the I want to say the brain, the, the execution environment, which right now it has to work with just, like, like a blob, basically, just, like, a bunch of bytecode. Uh, just um, when you are deploying a contract, it doesn't have any structure. It's just a bunch of, bunch of code, and the EVM goes code by code, by byte code by byte code. First, it verifies whether it's correct, whether it can even execute it, uh, whether it exists, whether it has enough of gas, whether it doesn't break any computation. And, it's, um, and this can be 
well uh, externalized to do it at the moment of deployment, which is great not just because we save the time at execution, but also um, but also uh, we will prevent having just a mess on the chain, which is unexecutable. Um, and uh, yeah, just 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 to mention, right? Like so now instead of just like random pieces of code, it will be structured like we have a header, this is the code, this is the, the data, and when the EVM comes, it can tell like, okay, the header explains the version, that, that's, mm. that's one important thing that will be the versioning, and uh, th this is the code that I'm looking for, and I need to verify this, right? right. It's, it's, it's good that you mentioned versioning, because that's basically where we wanted to start. <laughs> uh, so, like, what will be the implications of versioning? I mean, how do you see that going down and propagating through the levels all, all the way to the... To, to the depths or whatever you're building. Um, should, should I talk like it? Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I can, I can choose I, who I talks. Can. But George looks sure. like he wants to say yeah, something. Yeah, so yeah, no, I think uh, since we're talking a little bit less technically, more like narrative almost at this point. Um, first of all, I think one thing I want to say is that this is the first big change to the EVM itself, especially after all these upgrades to the protocol. Now it's uh, finally we're get, putting the spotlight on like one of the main things probably about this whole uh, Ethereum ecosystem. So that's first big change. And then the second, that within the change itself, we have the notion of versioning. So it's kind of an interesting thing how now we're going to be looking at even more explicitly looking into upgrading very core parts that are not even necessarily backwards compatible parts of the protocol as we're going to be upgrading them. And then on top of that, we're going to even have an explicit versioning part to it meaning that we are explicitly looking to have several different potentially not compatible versions of code kind of living on Ethereum. And we might have, correct me if I'm wrong, some, some contracts that are going to be able to speak to each other in future potentially not being able to speak with each other. Let's say if we have uh, EOF version 13, right, it might not be able to be, to be speaking to version 6. And then we were speaking in the green room right before this, how it might be interesting that this is, might spill out to different layer twos and how they might have their own dialects of the EOFs running there in different containers or, or code containers that might be a little bit slightly different from the main net and might be compatible, but maybe one way, not the other way. And just overall, kind of, I think it's, it's interesting how this is, isn't just a major upgrade of the EVM itself, but in itself, within the upgrade, we have a notion of that is going to be changing more and more. Uh, I also wanted to maybe like add something uh, that Mario mentioned before, like that's basically this could be chunk of an executable code, right? It's actually one of the cool things is that there are going to be introduced also data sections, right? Yep. For mm -hmm. like bytecode is not only uh, executable code. For many things, uh, the parts of a bytecode contain actual data because there is like code copy of codes and so on that can be used for. Uh, immutables, right? The factory contracts needs to store the bytecodes of the contracts they need to be deploying also somehow, right? And uh, like alternative is doing it in storage, but it's super expensive and there is no like mm -hmm. a way to uh, load large chunks of uh, storage in one go. There, you only can access it word by word. So it's like for many places, uh, the bytecode is used as a kind of data storage, right? Yep. And for me, it's like, this is honestly a really nice feature because now you can clearly distinguish between what's executable and what is used as like data, yep. right? Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for mentioning like, that. That's one of the important things to mention that like is the biggest upgrade to EVM in a while. Like, I mean, like the most significant upgrade we had was push zero this week. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like the EVM today looks almost the same like a few years yeah. ago. And the folks from the Ypsilon team, Axic, Pavel, Andre, has been working on EVM upgrades since like the Evasm era. And uh, this is something which they put a lot of work into. So I'm hoping that, that it's going to, going to like this, these changes in the EVM are very slow. It's also one thing. So we mentioned the versioning. Yeah, I wanted to react to that because I mean, it's um, uh, like we'll basically now have different. I want to say versions of EVM, but it's not like fully what people might imagine because there is uh, you cannot the, the changes that can be done in the each version are still limited. It's more like sure. it's, it's 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 the new version can add new features. Uh, it cannot it cannot change things, right? So so we can see that uh, the, the the contract or the the um, 
the developer can actually uh, can actually see that he's using this version and uh, and he's um, uh, he's compatible with with the new features. Let's say so it will might be even even easier to add more features, but um, also. It's like maybe more standardized approach to have the various EVMs around the ecosystem, especially for example, layer twos, right? Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I think Arbitrum already announced it, but uh, the, the idea was already like a year back at least, like we could have kind of beta version. I don't want to, don't quote me on this, but like another like version of EVM where we uh, changed, improved something, and this is running on layer twos. They tested, and maybe it get boosted up to maintenance at one point. Um, but uh, again, like this breaks the equivalency, right? Yeah. Which with some people are trying to, to reach. And generally, like there is a lot of issues with EOF as well. Like it's not it's not all fairy tales. Like it's pretty pretty a big. Um, uh, big problem to solve. Uh, that's why it got pushed from Shanghai to maybe Cancun, maybe Prague. Um, and um, yeah, and uh, one thing is that now we are going to basically break the EVM for all of the forks, which is like half of the, yeah. the crypto coins out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I'd like to add that, right? So it's not just a rainbow and sunshine, and there might be also the fragmentation. And now it's not only a technically a new arena for us to innovate, but also po probably a politically a new arena for fragmentation, right? So there are political actors like uh, kill switch for small countries. What if uh, the, uh, someone decides, oh, only this EVM, that specific feature, you know, enabled by better version versioning, which is a technical excellence perspective. What if uh, the political kind of hijacking is right? So I think that part uh, uh, we often less talk about in the technical circle, but uh, often uh, in crypt crypto there's a lot of this kind of good and evil sometimes uh, can, uh, can, can emerge as a conversation. Especially now that. as we have a lot of layer twos that are coming out like white labeled, like exchange-based exchange layer twos, like let's say uh, the Coinbase one. Mm -hmm. like, like we could definitely see something like that there. Yeah. And as well, as you, as you mentioned, like the fragmentation of the chains, but you also have the fragmentation in the tooling space. Mm -hmm. So the layer above, like the L2s is like, and the EVM is programming language, and the layer above that uh, is the tooling, the security components, the decompilers, etc. And they would also need to keep up with all the improvements on the, on the object format as well. Uh, yeah. I also... So wanted to add something <laughs> about the features uh, because it was mentioned here. Like basically, we are adding features, but honestly, with the OF one, at least like how it's now, it's technically we are constraining how the code can look and what it can do. It's technically a removal of features, you can say. It's uh, by forcing this blob of data mm -hmm. that's now to be of a certain shape. We are technically disallowing certain behaviors that yep. were kind of allowed before. And I think, I don't know if it will make into the final uh, EOF one or it will be some further EOFs. For example, self-destruct opcodes is going to be uh, kind of replaced by something self-doll opcodes. And this is, you can say, also like a feature removal, right? And it's technically like even like there was one proposal, uh, our uh, engineer Hubert Riesdorf, maybe people know, proposed to EOF itself uh, on the discussions and it's maybe going to be accepted is that there is no going to be longer a way to delegate call from the EOF into the uh, vanilla mm -hmm. EVM version, just because otherwise it will be like a backdoor to access all those features that yeah. technically right now are removed in EOF, right? But of course, like going further, maybe EOF 3, 4, 5 is going to be more feature rich than EOF 1, right? Yeah. So this is what you actually just said is a nice segue into like the following topic, uh, which is basically, I mean, Sure, there are like good sides and bad sides, and people are going to use EOF in various ways. But like, how do you see it starting to propagate in the, de in the developer community? Like, what do you see are the first use cases or usages for EOF in which types of projects? I mean, any kind of thoughts on, on that front you want to share? I guess one thing is we're, we're also trying to uh, battle this question earlier and trying to think like how is the adoption actually going to happen. One thing that kind of springs to mind and that often how these, especially in our space, these things happen is there's probably going to be a big player, like a big project, big protocol, you know, the, the Uniswaps of the world that's going to release their, their, their new smart contract version and uh, they're going to have it probably, you know, all up to date and then all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. 
with the EOF container version, you know, with the, with the newest EOF, whatever that's going to be, EOF1, or whatever that form is going to take. And they're going to say, we're now, you know, fully doing it up to the EOF contract with all the, um, with, with all the things removed that need to be removed, all the things there that need to be there. And then other players later on, as is usually the case in our space, will start to fork this, and that's going to start to propagate this. And then since these are going to be popular contracts, our security tooling is going to need to start to catch up with this, and it's going to start to adopt these features more. And then other security tools are going to start to follow. And slowly and slowly, everything is going to kind of avalanche from there. Uh, it's definitely just one of the ways I think that, that adoption is going to happen. But probably in my head, a big player is going to do this, and then that's where it's going to go. It's funny that you mentioned the Uniswap because, I mean, they've been pushing for the 1153, is it? The transient storage, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they had their own solution, basically. Mm -hmm. And now, now they kind of have to wait for the EOF. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, because, I mean, first of all, it needs to be implemented in compilers, right? I mean, Solidity have, that doesn't have it because, it, well, it's not even specified yeah. yet. We don't have final EOF specs. So, like, I'm... Uh, what I'm hoping for is that it will be on the solidity level or the compiler level. It will be uh, natively, uh, or like, won't be like some optional experimental feature, but it will be easy to use. So it will be basically utilized automatically by any contract. And um, yeah. yeah, hopefully we'll save a bunch of gas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure if the increment, increment, incre incremental change is uh, the best way to actually get this out. I'm just wondering if there's a chance for a uh, bit more leap forward type of improvements uh, that maybe something from scratch, like a new chain or something that uh, they say, hey, how about we start uh, from scratch uh, in this particular chain to demonstrate uh, something like a really, really new uh, as opposed to incrementally fix something in the e ecosystem already. So, but you guys probably should know more. It's actually interesting that you talk about like, starting new chains with these updates. Because with things like uh, ZKVMs, mm -hmm. they need to completely rewrite all their circuits with every single upgrade. I even wonder that, say, because there's a couple of ZKVMs, you know, supposedly already alive today, uh, for them to upgrade to the, with this new EOF version, I wonder if it's easier to just start a new layer two um, and then, you know, start a new instance of their ZKVMs with these upgrades as opposed to maintain the existing one and then try to upgrade it to the newer version with the EOF. Um, but um, to, to, to actually support these leaps is, is what you're saying. Because mm -hmm. for them, especially for these circuit-based ones, it's going to be very difficult to always keep up to date with incremental upgrades for all of this. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's great you mentioned it. Like, it was one of the points to be raised. Like, that there is like five ZK EVM projects right oh, yeah. now, and uh, they will have a, like, for, it's not trivial to, to change uh, something not so, so big as EVM uh, there or the EOF there. Um, but also on the, for all of the client teams, for all of the Ethereum clients, what it means now is that they basically need to maintain different versions of EVM because you, you want to do this full sync and now you need uh, with each hard fork or like in this case, let's say with e each EOF EVM version, version oh. an EF version later, you need, to, you need to execute this piece of student production that, okay, we switched to the new one and uh, that's, that's a lot of code paths to be maintaining, yeah. yeah. And on the adoption, I think uh, George and Mario, you mentioned a good thing. Uh, uh, I think that this space is incentive driven and mm -hmm. like uh, dApps need to find a way to uh, like mm, to reach the broader audience and for that they need better virtual machine. Yeah. And so they are pushing for the innovation on the virtual machine. Then the virtual machine is pushing the innovation on the compiler level. Then they are pushing the innovation on the tooling. And then we are also giving it back to the dev developers. Yeah. So it's like this whole circle of like incentives that and everybody is pushing in the in the in the right direction. Yeah. But yeah, of course it's like this innovation I think it essentially at least for Uniswap as well, it was motivated by uh, doing the same things but cheaper, right? Yeah. It's like in the end, it's uh, transaction gas you need to pay for, and the less you pay, the better. And exactly like the EOF, how I see like we are disabling jump up codes, right? And introducing new static jumps and like call Fs, and because exactly they're not gonna need to do the checks on like validity of the destination addresses and so on, I think it's uh, most likely they're gonna be cheaper and. Uh, this adoption can come just from the fact that using EOF1 is cheaper, yeah. right? Mm. 
I also recall, I think that now, well now, once EOF comes out, on-chain validators, specifically for like layer two is like a thing for optimism, say, you know, the arbitrums of the world, I think even for them it's not gonna be actually cheaper to run their on-chain verifiers to actually verify, you know, verify the state changes submitted by sequencers. Uh, and that's, you know, that's cheaper, cheaper proofs, cheaper rollups, and that's down, downstream cheaper for the users of those rollups. That's also more adoption, right? If, if I'm one layer two that doesn't adopt this and my competitor adopts it, and now suddenly they have much cheaper gas costs for their transactions because of the EOF, because their on-chain validators are that much cheaper, I'll be that much more encouraged to adopt this, this new uh, version as well. Do you guys think, <clears throat> I mean, one of the biggest things with EOF is definitely a much better utilization of resources and paying less gas and cheaper gas, but do you think that EOF will have uh, an impact on security, a positive impact on security, as we hope it will, or, you know, we're going to find some other problems down the road? I would say it's really a good question and it's really <laughs> undetermined. Uh, That's why I'm here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> out, um, like, last thing I remember was um, one update in Constantinople, I think, where the uh, storage operations were reprised and something like Ethereum, like, not Ethereum, Solidity was using as a gas uh, limit for enforcing uh, like operations uh, during the calls that just need to send the value and uh, you had enough gas on like the 2,100 gas, I think, um, to basically emit an event. Uh, and after the reprise, you actually could do some storage operations and it was uh, like problematic. Um, mm -hmm. In this case, like what I'm thinking, what's essentially happened in that update and why it's relevant to us, it's uh, the system allowed more behavior than it was before, right? And now, like with the EOF, at least how it looks like, again, the behavior is not added, it's removed mostly, right? So uh, at this point, I would say once uh, there is no backdoor to delegate call back to the more feature-rich EOF, I'm not super concerned about the security because you're technically just making more restricted systems that shouldn't break easily. But of course, uh, because the tooling needs to catch up with all these changes, maybe there's going to be some uh, compiler bugs again and so on, right? Mm. Uh, this, is, this is always a danger, right? So it takes a while to uh, test and uh, to validate such big changes, so yeah. Um, on, you mentioned before the call app opcode. I think it's going to uh, especially help us validate not just certain contracts, but look at the whole chain more holistically and understand better what's going on. Like right now, when you have the EVM execution, you basically uh, almost have no idea what's going on with uh, not non-verified uh, uh, contracts. But with the EOF and the code sections, we can better understand uh, what's, what's happening inside there. Yep. Yeah, I think that to that point, especially because, you know, a big thing right now in security is doing like war room analysis, you know, and a post mortem analysis and trying to determine what happened where with what contract and what happened with those transactions. Uh, with the EOF, supposedly it, it, should be, it should be much easier to actually perform some of these analytics on, you know, the attacker contracts and whatnot. But it's interesting because assuming that once the EOF comes out, you will still be able to, for some time, deploy legacy contracts, which are a lot more of a, you know, random byte, not random, but un unstructured bytecode that is much harder to actually uh, decode and understand. I wonder if the attackers in those cases will exclusively deploy non-EOF contracts to throw off all the new tooling that will be better, you know, better able to understand EOF contracts instead. Um, but, of course, you know, that's, I think, going to be, attackers are going to attack always. <laughs> Haters are going to hate. Um, but on the other hand, for, for good contracts and for good bugs, good bugs, you know, non-malicious, non-maliciously occurred bugs, with EOF it's going to be much easier to understand what happened and what, you know, what's going on there and what, 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 the, what those attacks did. Besides, besides EOF obviously improving the development process and hopefully the average quality of a smart contract, um, do you guys see, like, EIF for like smart contracts being used in any kind of 
Well, I don't want to say innovative ways because everything that we're doing in this space is more or less innovative, but something that we haven't seen up until now, is it going to open some new doors for people to do things differently or to do new things or something like that? Immediately, no. <laughs> oh, <of course. laughs> uh, I mean, in EOF itself, like the ones that's going to be recent, it's like, again, less features. So, say something that's now present in Solidity, like function pointers, it's going to be pretty harder to do it uh, without dynamic jumps, right? Uh, but what's big thing is versioning, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with versioning, all the doors are, can be opened. You know? Um, Axig had this dog, but it was like a year or maybe two years ago, um, about how EOF can work with equine abstraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, we might see some improvements on that front, like uh, actually utilizing it for more effective or more feature full account abstraction. And um, yeah, I'm wondering how the data, like now when we have the space for the data, whether it will be maybe, I mean, uh, what I was hoping for before was that this can be utilized uh, better to store the L2 data, but we will have blobs for that, maybe sooner than you have. So yeah, we'll see, we'll see about that. Um, sure. And like, <clears throat> since the effects of EOF will propagate, and you guys mentioned like, we need to develop tooling and everything else, uh, and this is not a tenderly shill, although it's our panel. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think EOF will impact tooling as a whole? Um. <laughs> well, I can start. <laughs> yeah, we're doing like security tooling, right? Uh, and uh, sometimes like we did a, uh, like static analysis on a bytecode. Yeah. Technically, it should become easier for such kind of tools that needs to dive into bytecode analysis, just because uh, dynamic jumps were, let's say, not the most ideal thing to deal with, especially during like some symbolic execution when you can jump to symbolic, uh, I mean, solidity things got, in most cases, had a good enough invariance where it never happened. Uh, but uh, for generic bytecode, like, it's like any bytecode that you can ever deploy, it was like a real problem. So for security tooling on a bytecode, it's gonna be most likely easier. No, an interesting thing there is, uh, I think there were some comments also online around EOF about this is that, because we had to deal with these problems as is in security tooling, some of them, or maybe even the majority, have already been kind of solved. Like we've adapted our security tools for that. Um, so ironically, while the impact is that it's going to be easier to create newer versions on this EOF stuff, we've already have existing code to deal with the previous problems. So we're going to have kind of like both. It's just going to be easier to adopt, I guess, newer tools and create newer versions of these tools. But also interestingly, we're going to need to maintain both at the, at, for the time being to take care of the legacy contracts as well. So there is a little, a little bit of uh, that slightly negative thing now that we're going to have to take, take care of like, both types of contracts or you know, styles of contracts on chain. I, I think the existing toolings definitely will, will push back on this, right? So because no one pays them to actually uh, do the upgrade. Uh, it's mm. like, <laughs> right, uh, like Ethos can have to upgrade their stuff. I mean, they're well paid, but uh, there are uh, people that are doing other toolings may not have the position to actually support both versions, and uh, the economic incentive has to be also, also there for them. Yeah. Right. Um, and then, yeah, uh, uh, you mentioned an interesting thing that uh, the tooling is going to have to keep up. I mean, uh, I completely agree with that. Uh, the interesting part there is that uh, we're, we're still in, like, this is the version one, and the uh, community is still yet to see the uh, real implementation of yeah. this and the possibility of the EOF. Uh, I think that once they get a sense of how they can utilize this, uh, what would be the improvements for them that they, uh, if were implemented, that they would benefit from, like we're going to see a huge number of use cases for it, and then the tools uh, uh, and security components will try to adapt based yeah. on that. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's like huge room for improvement in that area. Mm. Awesome. Mm. So the spotlight is back on me. You want more hard questions? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, honest, no, I, I, have, I have one more because um, like the people, at least some of the people will want to know. Uh, well, UF is just getting started mm. and we don't really have still any kind of best practices or guidelines or use cases which you could refer to, either good or bad. Like, do you think 
the the best practices will be led by you know the Ethereum Foundation or the team behind the EOF, or it is more likely to come from one of the projects which will implement it well and use it well and act as a use case to be replicated throughout the industry. I think it's a silly answer, but uh, all of them. <laughs> uh, specifically because the team behind the, um, that, that's pushing the EOF, the team Epsilon excellent. that you were mentioning, I mean, they're just excellent. I mean, they maintain so many pages about this and they constantly update all of them and they you know, provide all of this stuff. So many HackMD docs, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know how many HackMD docs I had to go through for this panel. <laughs> um, so without a doubt, I feel like once we get closer to implementation and once we have all of these things already set up with the specs and whatnot, they're going to also give out, you know, here's what we think is best practices, because of, of course, I mean, it's their, their child, their baby. Um, but likewise, I think, like, as I was mentioning earlier, I think one or two bigger projects are going to try to jump on this to also claim the spotlight, quite frankly, say, we're the first big one that adopted fully this EUF spec, and here's how we did it, here are our best practices, and then that's going to be the new holy grail of other developers' projects to like, follow this. So, but I do think there's definitely going to be different pushes, and some for altruistic reasons, like the Ypsilon team, you know, to help out with their own little project uh, for the sake of the Ethereum ecosystem, and some a little bit more lucrative to like, say, like, we are the first ones who got this UF spec right, and here's our best practices, and do it like that. Um, um, yeah, just to mention again, like with the HackMD pages, I believe that Axic made some like solidity examples or oh. some, some uh, some examples of, or of how EF should be used. Not sure if it's best practices, but because I mean we are still too early. Uh, not that we don't have implementation, we the specification is also not properly figured out. Like the late, what I would recommend the latest reading is the mega EOF yeah. endgame, if oh, I'm yeah. correct, mm -hmm. right? So like that would be the the current state of the of the EOF. Um, and then, yeah, what I'm interested in, or like what will be fun, will be the race to be the first contract, not, not like do it properly, but right. just to be the first just EOF first contract on the main ad. Yeah, we saw that in, with Push Zero as well. What first not? DKVM. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, you can make NFT out of that or whatever. Yeah. First EOF on the main ad. Well, we, we probably will make an NFT out of it. <laughs> uh, uh, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, I would like to leave this time for you guys to share some final thoughts or whatever you find interesting about EOF or like, you know, whatever crosses your mind. I actually have a question to the rest. It's panel. not a question, it's a statement. Oh, I have, I have, <laughs> I have a question. Uh, so like we mentioned that it's like best practices, but this practice, best practices, you mean like for most developers, they are not working with the bytecode, right? They're working with yep. Solidity. In this case, are you thinking that like Solidity will change a lot because of how the bytecode uh, that Solidity needs to compile into will change? Yes. Honestly, it's like there is a layer between developers and uh, bytecode, which is Solidity, and I expect like if it's done well, people yep. won't even feel the change. Maybe it's like the only best practice so far. Don't use function pointers. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm not really quite sure on this one, but I feel like, uh, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, colleagues, but uh, you could end up utilizing the data part of the, of the code a little bit differently, right? And I feel like there could be some clever tricks and best practices around that that could be utilized. So things like that, I think, could come up. So, I mean, like, the best practices are inline bytecode, right, if you are a proper solidity <laughs> hacker. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, there is the layer. Of, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I was mentioning. Like, I hope that solidity implementation, the compiler will work so smooth that, like, we won't even notice. But still, for example, version is something that you need to work with, mm -hmm. right? Like, there will be some, some subtle changes that we notice, yeah. It's very interesting and speculation, like, what if Viper does... Uh, you have better than solidity. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I wanted to mention like that, that's an, a, another thing with the tooling that I hope that Viper will catch up on EOF and uh, Fee Fe as well, which is uh, which is also already production ready, and now they will have a lot of work to catch up as well. Yeah. Yeah, but in a way they have in a way they have less work to do because they haven't been so spread out. But I, I get your point completely. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Nebusha, some closing thoughts? Oh, um, <laughs> just that 
uh, I'm really excited about uh, the implementation of the UF. It's been like, what, nine years since we made any like significant changes on the EVM bytecode, and uh, this opens the door to like uh, new possibilities. And like, uh, once we change the base layer, uh, the, the the layer above that are going to change as well, and probably introduce some new way uh, um, of developing and. Uh, more introduce uh, ways uh, of having more security uh, on each above layer as well. Yeah, I completely mm -hmm. agree. I think the most exciting part for me is like what this change means, mm -hmm. and that it's not a protocol change now, it's the EVM, the computing change, and then in itself it has suggestions for future changes and future upgrades. And I feel like it's just going to encourage a lot more, uh, maybe even wild experimentation on what could happen with the EVM later. Um, and yeah, that's just exciting. Awesome. I, I, I honestly completely agree with that. Guys, thank you so much for being a part of this panel. I think I speak in everyone's name that we all enjoy this. And for you guys, thanks for listening. And I hope you found this fun and useful. Uh, a big applause for the guys. Thank you so much.